everybody. Tonight we're going to be talking about Sutta 117, the Great Forty. So this Sutta is about the Eightfold Path. <clears throat> the Eightfold Path is the path to the cessation of suffering in the Four Noble Truths. So the first Noble Truth is the truth of suffering. The second is the truth of the cause of suffering. The third is the cessation of suffering. And the fourth is the path leading to the cessation of suffering, the Eightfold Path. So suffering, uh, unfortunately, we're all familiar with. This is defined as not getting what we want, uh, uh, having what we want going away, aging, death, um, pain, grief, and despair, and so on. Uh, suffering happens when we are out of sync with uh, our reality, when we have an image of how things should be that does not line up. Um, suffering can involve pain, but it doesn't have to. Um, I worked in an ER for about four years, and during the time in ER, ER is a very interesting place to work. Uh, every day is different. You see different people. Uh, every day someone is born. Every day someone dies. Every day someone breaks their arm, has an ear infection or a headache. Everything in between. Uh, working there, you get an interesting perspective on life and death. Um, after you've seen people come back from obvious death, and obviously healthy people pass, uh, for no apparent reason, and how you look at them, well, it, it changes your perspective on things. When you're, but it's a wonderful way to help people, and it's actually a pretty exciting way to work. People in that facility, in that kind of healthcare environment, are very good at what they do, and everyone works at it as a team together, and there's a real chance for flow and perfection and action in a way. When everyone is doing their job, correctly together. It's, it's a pretty magical moment where everyone knows what everyone else will do, everyone is working in sync and working together to make a good outcome. Yeah. But also what you see in the ER is a lot of people in pain, a lot of people on a very bad day or maybe their worst day. And it's interesting how people react to that pain. Um, there is a pain scale that is given to people there. Uh, it's, a, it's a list of numbers one to 10, and there's a smiley face next to one and a frowny t face next to 10. And when you show it to people, you say, uh, what's your scale on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst pain imaginable and zero being no pain at all? You know, smiley face or frowny face. And what they tell you correlates very well. It's, it's very internally consistent with their pain. And it's interesting what people say about this. So people that are, can be dying of cancer, can be dying of very serious illness or suffering uh, very serious issues may say their pain is at a three or a four. And people that, you know, dislocated their finger, have a headache, uh, you know, cut or things that we might think would not cause so much pain, their numbers could be eight, nine, and 10. And they could be honestly answering that question. So that's really interesting. It's really interesting how someone can suffer so much uh, from a discomfort like that. And someone who we would think would be in terrible pain says they're not. I think that is because of their uh, acceptance or concept of what should be happening to them. When the pain is accepted as it is, and there is no expectation it should be different, it is not as intense. And that's, that's how they experience it. And when the expectation or the understanding of the pain is that it shouldn't be there, that it should not be happening, um, after all the cut just happened or the finger just got dislocated, then it can be excruciating because they're fighting with what is happening rather than accepting it. 
So pain does not equal suffering. And also the, the inverse is interesting too. I, I think it's kind of interesting that we use babies and small animals and puppies to generate metta. When these are very scary things, your baby will take your time, your patience and your money for 18 to 20 to 30 years. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, they, they do. I'm a parent, I know. The puppy is shortly after that gonna go pee on the floor and destroy your stuff. And, and we, we think of them and we smile. Like, I think that's about expectation too, maybe, yeah. We have no expectation of them except interaction. And so what we get is loving kindness. So, yeah. So suffering is, the cause of suffering is craving. Uh, the, so, the cause of suffering is not accepting what is happening. Uh, craving uh, is what happens, is what pulls us out of our view of seeing things in an impersonal way and into an opinion about it, a decision that it is mine, that it should change. The cessation of suffering is simply the cessation of expectation, the cessation of craving, uh, entering into a mind that has no expectations and can see things as they are impersonally. And the path leading to that immediately and in the long term is the Eightfold Path. The cessation of suffering can happen very quickly when we six are. And in fact, we'll be talking about tonight that the six R's will fulfill the Eightfold Path at every place we look. The long-term cessation of suffering involves from changing our relationship with our reality, changing how we interact with it, uh, letting go of our fetters, and changing how we, how we are. Um, and that is also what the Eightfold Path points us to. So, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati and Jetta's Grove, Anathampandika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Monks, I shall teach you noble right collectedness with its supports and requisites. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the monks replied. The Blessed One said this. What monks is noble right collectedness with its supports and its requisites, that is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. Unification of mind equipped with these seven factors is called noble right, right collectedness with its supports and its requisites. And this explains the Eightfold Path. Uh, these are requisites that when, when fulfilled, they will support right collectedness, which will then allow us to address the suffering immediately and in the long term. Therein, monks, right view comes first. And right view absolutely comes first. With right view, everything is obvious. When one has right view, true right view, one can actually figure out uh, how things work themselves. Anything you do with right view can fulfill the Eightfold Path, or I should say your daily life and all your activities can full, fulfill the Eightfold Path when you have right view. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view as wrong view, and right view as right view. This is one's right view. And what monks is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no fruit or result of good or bad actions, no this world, no other world, no mother, no father, no beings who are born spontaneously, no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is wrong view. 
So this describes a view that does not acknowledge causality, that does not acknowledge the results of good and bad actions, that what we do affects ourselves short-term and long-term, and even that what we do does not affect what happens uh, to other people, potentially. This is interestingly very much like the reduction materialistic view. Yeah, they're uh, like that. The view in and of itself is not a problem. Um, it's just a view, it's just a concept. The problem with the view is what it leads our actions to do and what it leads us to do. Based on our views, we, we act. Yeah. When we do not have a view of causality uh, and of right and wrong or good and bad outcomes for our actions, we will be potentially tempted to act in ways that cause harm to ourselves and those around us. Um, and, and so this is why this is wrong view. Acting in this way with this view uh, may lead to our harm for a long time to come. And what monks is right view? Right view, I say, is twofold. It is right view that is affected by taints, partaking in merit, ripening any acquisitions, and there is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the path. So, right view affected by taints. The taints uh, this can be translated as cankers, like a canker sore. Uh, the word is asava. It's uh, translated as outflows or inflows, outfluxes. It can be also translated as distraction. The taints are habits that pull us out of right view, uh, potentially, that pull us into becoming. Uh, so the taints are, we can say there's maybe three or five of them, depending how we classify them. Um, there is the, the taint of desire for sensual pleasure, the taint of ignorance, the taint of desire for uh, birth in higher, uh, higher realms, desire for not, or desire for becoming, and desire for not becoming. That's the fourth one maybe, we could flip it around. And the, the last one is the taint of views. Um, most presentations will have three, but some presentations will throw in views. Views is the ideas of wrong, different kinds of wrong view that lead to mental proliferation. These are ideas of, I am the body, I am not the body, I, am, I exist in this way or not in that way basically philosophical, unprovable ways of looking at the world. The problem with these is they lead to mental proliferation and why they are considered the taints. And all of the taints will lead to mental proliferation as well. Mental proliferation separates us from what is happening. Mental proliferation is thinking about things, our ideas and concepts about things. When one becomes a sotapanna, one lets go of the taint of views. This means one has the ability to not be perplexed about what's happening and simply be in the present moment and view it just as it is. And in reality, this happens before sotapanna. Every time we six are, uh, we enter a clear mind without craving that can see reality as it is without proliferation. The taint of desire for sensual pleasures, this is let go of when uh, desire, when greed and aversion is let go of at Anagami. So the desire for sensual pleasures, um, this one, when we look at the sense door operation, we can see how this works clearly. So in the example, this example, we should use something like chocolate. So if we're examining chocolate, which is a fantastic uh, object of uh, investigation, because the taste sense door operates so slowly, 
It's maybe the slowest sense door, so we can watch things progress. The, the eye is very fast. Uh, you can see these things with the eye too, but it's much, much faster than the taste sense door. So we put the chocolate in our mouth and first we notice the materiality, the hardness, the cohesion, the texture. Immediately after that, we have taste, tongue contact, bitterness, sweet. And then if we pay close attention, we notice from those the explosion of the taste of chocolate, which is none of those, it's something else probably quite pleasant. I know people that don't like chocolate. That might be wrong view as well. <laughs> and right after the taste of chocolate, there is a contraction around the feeling. Um, there is identification with it and there's thoughts. I like that. That's good. Or hopefully not, it's bad chocolate. And immediately that, there's more thoughts. Geez, I had chocolate like this before. Huh, I wonder if I should eat more of the chocolate or should I save it for later? And so on. That is mental proliferation and it separates us from the chocolate. And this is the tragedy and paradox. A sensual desire is because it separates us from its object. Quite unsatisfactory. So the solution, of course, is to 6R and end the mental proliferation so we can really examine the chocolate. And this is actually the solution with all the taints is to 6R and to attend appropriately uh, with uh, some, some variations and strategies, but basically it's bringing up, clear, bringing up your clear mind and not allowing the proliferation to result. The taint of ignorance is the taint of forgetting the Four Noble Truths, which is basically forgetting to be mindful, forgetting to observe. When we let go of the taint of ignorance or when we have the, with the power of mindfulness developed or a well-developed faculty of mindfulness. We see things automatically without effort. They happen and they're there just as they are. And again, there is no proliferation in that. So ripening in the acquisitions means ripening in the five aggregates. So mundane right view leads to outcomes in the world. It leads to wholesome outcomes. It leads to good things. It leads to positive states, but it does not necessarily uh, lead to a mental development or the, or the super mundane paths. And there is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. And what monks is right view that is affected by the taints partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. There is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. There is a fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are born spontaneously. There are in the world good and the virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is right view affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. This is a view of causality, that what happens now, that our intentions lead to results and they matter. This is the, uh, the view of kama. Kama is created by our intention and our action. When we have an intention and we act on it, in deed, speech, and mind, we create kama. In kama, it leads to results now and in the future. Understanding this, we're more likely to act in skillful ways in the present. And understanding this, we, we know what we do now matters. This means what we do reinforces our, our behavior. So when we act a certain way now, we're more likely to act a certain way in the future. 
This is very important for meditation practice. When we're dealing with a hindrance, uh, how we deal with it will affect the future arising of the hindrance. So if you are dealing with restlessness in your sit and you are wanting to move and end your sit, you have a couple of options there. When you're restless and it's time to end your sit because you were going to anyway, well, that's fine. But if you are tempted to end your sit earlier because of the restlessness, if you choose to break your sit because of the restlessness, you are giving in to uh, the effect of that feeling. That feeling of that hindrance of restlessness is uh, driving behavior. And when that behavior manifests, you're more likely to do it again in the future. You're giving in to the restlessness. And furthermore, restlessness is more likely to arise in the future. People can be quite comfortable sitting a certain length of time. And when they start giving into restlessness and ending their sit early, this happens in daily life more commonly than on retreat. Then the next time restlessness comes up, they're more likely to end the sit. And it comes up earlier, right? Because it comes up before the sit ends. So their, sh their sit shortens and shortens. And before long, it's not comfortable for them to sit very long at all. They reinforce that pattern. And conversely, when we do not engage in the hindrance, we do, when we do not let it uh, dictate our behavior, when we allow it to be there, when we don't interfere, we don't take it personally, we accept it, we relax, smile, come back to our object of meditation, that hindrance loses power to affect our behavior our attachment to that set of sensations goes down and reduces. So in, in every given moment, we have a choice if we're going to be making what kind of, of comma. We're going to be making unwholesome comma. We're going to be making wholesome comma. Are we going to be making comma that leads to, uh, leads to a right view and super mundane right view? That's always our choice. And what uh, monks is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the path? So in some presentations, right view is going to be presented as the four noble truths. Uh, and this is, this is correct. Um, the four noble truths are, um, they fulfill a uh, right view. The thing is, there are different ways of understanding the Four Noble Truths. By that I mean you can have an intellectual understanding of the Dhamma um, and versus an experiential understanding of the Dhamma. Intellectual understanding is important. That's how we get to experiential understanding, but it is not the same thing. Our concept of what things are is different than their reality. And that's a plug for one of my favorite books, actually, Concept and Reality. If you haven't, it's on the back table. It discusses some of these things. Very good. But the concept, the intellectual understanding of the Four Noble Truths um, is one thing. And people can be very skillful in their intellectual understandings and their ability to use language and their ability to discuss topics and still not have an experiential understanding. Uh, language is meant to be this way. We use it as a symbol to convey meaning, to try to convey our experience. And this is its purpose. But unless we understand this, it can be a trap too. We can be trapped in the words and what we think they mean rather than what they actually mean. A really clear example of this is talking about color. The word blue, we know what this means, but it is extremely different than the experience of blue. Yeah. And this is okay when we're talking about colors. When we're talking about the Dhamma, it's important to understand that there are levels to this and what we're going for is an experiential understanding. And frequently what seems complex in language and in words uh, is extremely simple and is 
It is extremely simple in our direct experience when we understand it. That's the Dhamma. And so the Four Noble Truths uh, at an experiential level certainly fulfills this idea of right view that we're going to talk about in the Sutta. And what monks is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path? The wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states, enlightenment factor, the path factor of right view in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is the right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. So wisdom is seeing dependent origination. It is seeing things as they are. Uh, the power of wisdom and the faculty of wisdom, again, is seeing dependent origination. And investigation is observation into that. So what this is really saying is right view is observation of one without uh, taints, with one whose mind is free from craving. It is observation. It's how they observe. That is right view. That is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. And you notice they say right view in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless. So this is an arahat who possesses the noble path. This is one in training, someone between stream entry and our hot path, and is developing the noble path. That is someone who's not yet entered into Sotapanna. So one uh, mind who, who's noble, who's done the six R's, who has released craving. Observation is right view. Now right view does not come into full fruition until our hotship. And it is, but, but this is accessible by everyone. One makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view. This is one's right effort. Right effort, as we talked about, is the six R's. Uh, letting go of an unarisen, of an unarisen, unwholesome state. Preventing unarisen, unwholesome states from arising. Uh, bringing up an uh, unarisen wholesome state and sustaining that state. So letting it be there, relaxing and smiling and bringing up the object to meditation. Mindfully one abandons wrong view, mindfully one enters uh, upon it and, and abides in right view. This is one's right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is remembering to observe the movements of mind attention. It all interconnects here, yeah. Thus, these three states run and circle around right view. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Right intention. Therein, monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong intention as wrong intention, and right intention as right intention. This is one's right view. In what monks is wrong intention? The intention of sensual desire, the intention of ill will, and the intention of cruelty. This is wrong intention. And what is right intention? Right intention, I say, is twofold. That is the right intention that is affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, and there is a right intention that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the right path of the path. And what monks is right attention that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening and acquisitions, the intention of renunciation, intention of non-ill will, and the intention of non-cruelty. This is right attention that is affected by the taints, ripening and acquisitions. Intentions uh, are images that we hold. Uh, they are directions we point our mind in. They are ways we, we direct our mind. We can say intention of non-ill will is a positive image. Uh, intention of non-cruelty is a positive image. We hold all kinds of images all the time. We uh, 
and it's good to notice what images you're holding for yourself about yourself about the world again when these images are in conflict with reality they're a cause of suffering and the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves affect our behavior and what we do we can intend our intention we can choose our intention we can choose what images we hold in mind and we can choose to all hold thoughts of non-ill will towards ourself, to those around us. And we can choose to hold uh, thoughts of ill will. I would recommend the latter or the former, yeah. Metta is an intention. It's an image that we can hold. We can have the intention of generosity. And how we hold these images how we are generous with those around us uh, matters and affects what will happen in the future. It affects how we build our karma um, and it affects what will happen ne next in, in our meditation and our experience. When we're holding a positive intention about things, uh, when we can reframe things in a non-personal way, the suffering can go away. When we think things are our fault, when we think things are wrong, it should not be there, this allows them to persist. So our goal in holding right view is to hold generous thoughts of ill will that will support our practice and support those around us and support generosity that way. And what monks is right intention that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. The thinking, thought, intention, mental collectedness, directing of mind, verbal formation of one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path, and is developing the noble path. This is right intention that is noble, a factor of the path. So this is simply the intention and collectedness and thoughts of one with a mind without craving. Naturally without craving, thoughts of ill will do not arise. Naturally we do not have intentions that are in disharmony with those around us. When we have a clear mind, when we have no craving, we do not break precepts. The only reason we would break precepts is because of the personal view, because we're trying to control our experience. Because these thoughts of ill will, they harm those around us. And when, those, when we harm our environment, we're harming ourselves. It makes absolutely no sense to do that. And so seeing things impersonally seeing things as they are, we're not going to be harboring thoughts of ill will. One makes an effort to abandon wrong intention and to enter upon right intention. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong intention. Mindfully, one enters and abides in right intention. This is one's right mindfulness. Mindfully, you can choose to be playful and curious. Mindfully, you can notice that a heavy thought has entered into your mind stream. And mindfully, you can let that go and choose a lighter thought. These three states run and circle around a right intention, that is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Speech. There in monks, Right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong speech as wrong speech and right speech as right speech. This is one's right view. And what monks is wrong speech? False speech, malicious speech, harsh speech, and gossip. This is wrong speech. And what monks is right speech? Right speech, I say, is twofold. There is right speech that is affected by the taints partaking in merit, ripening in the acquisitions, and there is right speech that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the path. In what monks is right speech that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, 
abstinence from false speech, abstinence from malicious speech, abstinence from harsh speech, abstinence from gossip. This is right speech that is affected by the taints, ripening and acquisitions. In what monks is right speech that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the paths, path, that is desisting from the four kinds of verbal misconduct, the abstaining, refraining, refraining, abstinence from them in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right speech that is noble, a factor of the path. And so what's the difference between these two? The difference is uh, intention. Uh, the, the first ripening of acquisitions, one is trying to do that, resisting other kinds of speech. In the, in the super mundane path, it is natural for the mind not to engage in those kinds of speech. So the inclination doesn't even arise. This doesn't mean that one with a clear mind uh, does not have difficult conversations or say difficult things. Uh, or it, it is, but it does mean things can be said at the right time in the best possible way that one knows how to, like that. Um, it is always better to engage in difficult conversations with the mind with loving kindness, with a clear mind, than otherwise. Um, when we enter a potential conflict that way, we have a chance of seeing the other person's perspective, and they have a chance of knowing that they are seen. In some cases, this is going to deflect the conflict and diffuse it. In some cases, it will not. Um, but in those cases, at least you'll have a clear mind with loving kindness. For loving kindness is protective. With loving kindness, well, when your mind is happy and you're having a wonderful day, nothing can bring you down. Yeah. When you bring that mind to what you're doing, uh, everything is okay. And big problems don't seem so big. With your mind of loving kindness, you're not as affected by negativity. And the loving kindness meditation is one of the protective meditations, uh, partially for this reason. One makes an effort to abandon wrong speech and to enter upon right speech. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong speech. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right speech. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right speech. That is right view, right effort, right mindfulness. Action. Therein, monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong action as wrong action and right action as right action. This is one's right view. And what monks is wrong action? Killing living beings, taking what is not given, and misconduct and sensual pleasures, this is wrong action. In what monks is right action? Right action, I say, is twofold. There is right action that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. There is right action that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. In what monks is right action that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions? Abstinence from killing living beings, abstinence from taking what is not given, abstinence from misconduct and sensual pleasures. This is right action that is affected by the taints, ripening and acquisition. Basically keeping your precepts, keeping your sila. And what monks is right action that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path, the desisting from the three kinds of bodily misconduct, the abstaining, refraining, abstinence from them in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and developing the noble path. This is right action that is noble, a, fact, a factor of the path. Noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. And this means automatically keeping your precepts. When one has entered on the path and stream entry, one's relationships to the hindrances changes or the precepts changes and one naturally will not want to harm, cause harm on other beings. One will naturally not want to lie. 
naturally not want to take what's not given. I've seen this working with people in this transformation and it is quite interesting. Uh, it becomes important uh, to, to do the right thing, to not cause harm. And it becomes a very automatic thing. Whereas before they would have no problem telling a lie or saying little white lie, eating the coworker's lunch, whatever it is. And now they will not, just will not. They'll take the insect outside rather than kill it. And that just happened. It's quite remarkable. One makes an effort to abandon wrong action and to enter upon right action. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong action. Mindfully one enters upon and dwells in right action. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right action. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Livelihood. There in monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong livelihood as wrong livelihood and right livelihood as right livelihood. This is one's right view. And what monks is wrong livelihood? Scheming, talking, hinting, belittling, belittling, pursuing gain with gain. This is wrong livelihood. So that is wrong livelihood um, that is directed towards people living monastic uh, life. Um, it, for, it is also put as uh, avoiding sales in intoxicants, poisons, uh, human beings. That's uh, pretty general. Um, another way of thinking about this is having a livelihood that does not uh, cause precepts to be broken or cause harm to other beings. And what monks is right livelihood? Right livelihood is twofold. There is right livelihood that is affected by taints partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. And there is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. And what monks is right livelihood that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. Here monks, a noble disciple abandons wrong livelihood and gains his living by right livelihood. This is right livelihood that is affected by the taints, ripening in acquisition. And what monks is right li livelihood that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path, path? The desisting from wrong livelihood, the abstaining, refraining, abstinence from it in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path, and is developing the noble path. This is right livelihood that is noble, affected by acquisition, by noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. So right livelihood, I think, can be fleshed out a little bit, and we can talk about how we interact in our daily life. What is our livelihood? How do we live our lives? The short answer is to bring love and kindness in everything we do and to share this with generosity in those around us. Of course, not breaking precepts, but of course, bringing uh, kindness and, and love to our interactions. We, in order to do this, we have to remember the practice and remember the meditation, remember to 6R. Uh, in this, this can be a challenge. It, can be very challenging to decide to keep loving kindness with you all day. Uh, as people try to do this ever universally, everyone is surprised by how difficult it is. You can start the day intending to be with loving kindness and all of a sudden you're it's the next day and you're like, oh, I was going to do that, huh? No. So this is where mindfulness games and mindfulness tricks come into play to help us bring this with us all the time. The first one is one you're practicing now, which is smiling all the time. If we set the intention to always have a smile on our face, uh, whatever we're doing, this is actually easier for most people than remembering the feeling of loving kindness. It's a physical posture. It seems to be easier to remember. And as you're learning, you connect your smile to the feeling of loving kindness and is automatically connected. And so this will keep it going as well. 
when we're smiling all the time, then we get to interact with people when we're smiling all the time. And this is the other part of this practice, the smiling at strangers. I'm from Minnesota. Minnesotans are very uh, nice superficially. We have Minnesota nice, very kind. And there's also in that Minnesota nice is a lack of actual interaction um, and deeper, deeper interaction with people. I think this is an interesting thing. It probably comes from cold winters and cultures with very cold winters when you really need to get along with your neighbors no matter what. Um, but it also means when someone grins at you authentically, randomly walking down the street, it's quite a moment sometimes. So you do this. You do this for them. You do this for your practice. They get to be grinned at by someone with loving kindness and you get to see what happens. So sometimes they react and they smile right back. And this is a nice reflex, a normal reflex, because we use our smile to transmit loving kindness quite effectively. But sometimes they don't. They look away, they look confused. They even get upset about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah invading their space somehow. And this is our chance to check in on how we're doing. What is our intention in that moment? What does our mind do when they frown at us? Do we go to, oh my, is my smile wrong? Is there something in my teeth? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Or do we immediately go to, oh, they must be having a tough day. Hmm, too bad they didn't get to smile with me. That might have been fun, huh? Yeah. When we're grounded under loving kindness is firm, we're protected from that negativity and we have compassion reflexively. And when, uh, when we're less grounded, we get to see the other thing happen too. That's fine, we get to see. We relax, smile, and come back and keep playing the game. Another fun game is the sticker game. And this is getting sticky notes and putting them around your house in random places. You could put the word smile on there or a smiley face. These should be in places you don't go to very often. If you put them on like the refrigerator door, pretty soon it's going to become invisible. If you put them in places you see all the time, you won't see them. So you put them in cabinets, you open only sometimes, put them uh, by the dryer, washer, uh, you know, random places. And then when you see them, you remember to smile. Or you've noticed that you've been smiling. When I first did this practice, I had roommates. I was living with a couple of guys and you know, I think they thought it was pretty weird, but <laughs> they had to deal with that too. And we're close friends, it's fine. Um, still are even, and um, yeah, so that's a fun one. And then the last set is specific mindfulness cues. Mindfulness cues can be challenging or less challenging and I would suggest a challenge, an example of a challenging mindfulness cue is to smile every time you go through a doorway or to have loving kindness every time you sit down. That's very advanced. That you will forget very quickly. Um, so you start with simple cues. I think two good cues are uh, radiating loving kindness to two groups of people. Uh, I think elders, and very young children are really good candidates for this. It can be other groups of people you don't see very often too. Um, but these are good groups because both these groups of people really can appreciate and use loving kindness and are actually more likely to reciprocate it. Um, so sending loving kindness to a child in a restaurant is fun. They know what's going on immediately and they'll smile right back at you and you'll have a great thing going on until the parent notices and is confused. Then you send them loving kindness too. You get to see how you react. Yeah. No, but, but children are wonderful. They understand this practice instinctively. Uh, with my boy, I started teaching him loving kindness at a very, very young age and he understood it quickly because he was young, because he was two. And two-year-olds understand happy feelings. They understand a happy feeling in their heart for people in their lives. And that makes sense to them. So you can do this with young children. 
and they'll remember it. Yeah. So, yeah, right livelihood, I think we should expand into how we interact with the world and how we bring our mindfulness and our meditation everywhere with us. One makes an effort to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter upon right livelihood. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong livelihood. Mindfully one enters upon and dwells in right livelihood. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right livelihood, that is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. The Great Forty. There in monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, right intention comes to being. In one of right intention, right speech comes to being. In one of right speech, right action comes into being. In one of right action, right livelihood comes into being. In one of right livelihood, right effort comes into being. In one of right effort, right mindfulness comes to be, into being. Right mindfulness is simply remembering to observe the movements of mind's attention. Remembering to observe comes into being. One of right mindfulness, right collectedness comes into being. Right collectedness is the jhanas. In one of right collectedness, right knowledge comes into being. And right knowledge here refers to the knowledge of arahatship, the destruction of the taints. This is the ninth factor. Um, in one of right knowledge, right deliverance comes into being, and that's simply being one, one whose taints is destroyed. Thus, monks, the path of the disciple in higher training possesses eight factors. The arahat possesses ten factors. There in monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, wrong view is abolished. And the many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong view as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right view as condition come to fulfillment by development. In one of right intention, wrong intention is abolished, and the many unwholesome states that originate with wrong intention as condition are also abolished, and the many wholesome states that originate with right intention as condition come into fulfillment by development. In right speech, wrong speech is abolished, and the many unwholesome states that originate with wrong speech as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right speech as condition come into fulfillment by development. In one of right action, wrong action is abolished. And the many evil and wholesome states that originate with wrong action as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right action as condition come to fulfillment by development. In one of uh, right livelihood, wrong livelihood is abolished. And the many evil and wholesome states that originate with wrong livelihood as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right livelihood as condition come into fulfillment by development. In one of right, right effort, wrong effort is abolished. And the many evil and wholesome states that originate with wrong effort as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right effort as condition come into fulfillment by development. In one of right mindfulness, wrong mindfulness is abolished. In the many evil and wholesome states that originate with wrong mindfulness as condition are also abolished. In the many wholesome states that originate with right mindfulness as condition come into fulfillment by development. In one of right collectedness, wrong collectedness is abolished. And the many evil and wholesome states that originate with wrong collectedness as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right collectedness as condition come into fulfillment by development. In one of right knowledge, wrong knowledge is abolished. And the many evil and wholesome states that originate with wrong knowledge as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right knowledge as condition come to fulfillment by development. 
and one of right develop what right deliverance, wrong deliverance is abolished. And the many evil and wholesome states that originate with wrong deliverance as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right deliverance as condition come to fulfillment by development. Thus, monks, there are 20 factors on the side of the wholesome and 20 factors on the side of the unwholesome. This Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty has been set rolling and cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma in the world. Bhikkhus, if any recluse or Brahmin thinks that this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty should be censured and rejected, then there are 10 legitimate deductions from his assertion that provide grounds for censuring him here and now. If that worthy one censures right view, then who would be honor and praise those recluses that are wrong view? If one worthy censures right intention, then he would honor and praise those recluses who are of wrong intention. If that worthy one censures right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right collectiveness, right knowledge, and right deliverance, then he would honor and praise those recluses and Brahmins that are of wrong deliverance. If any recluse or Brahmin thinks that this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty should be censured and rejected, then these are ten legitimate deductions from his assertions that would prove grounds for censuring him here and now. Monks, even those teachers from Akala, Vasa and Bhayana, who held the doctrine of non causality, the doctrine of non doing, and the doctrine of nihilism, would not think that this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty should be censured and rejected. Why is that? For fear and blame, attack and confutation. This is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So, the Eightfold Path is fulfilled by the six R's. And by fulfilling the aspects of the Eightfold Path, uh, we support our meditation and our collectiveness. And in fact, our meditation, if we are not fulfilling these to some degree, is going to be very difficult to make progress in. Like that. Okay. Well, let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. <coughs> may beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.